Retro Studios is a video game development company with a turbulent history. Yet they're also widely revered for their largely successful effort in revitalizing both the Metroid franchise and the Donkey Kong Country series. Retro Studios was founded in 1998 in Austin, Texas by Jeff Spangenberg, who made a big name for himself in the 1990s as the founder of Iguana Entertainment. Remember them? As a subsidiary of Acclaim, Iguana created Arrow the Acrobat, ported the incredibly popular NBA Jam games to the home consoles, and created the extremely popular Turok the Dinosaur Hunter for the Nintendo 64. But despite its success, Iguana was squashed by its parent company Acclaim in 1998, and this left Jeff Spangenberg with the opportunity to start something new. Retro Studios was started with the financial backing of Nintendo, who sought to have an exclusive relationship with the guy who had led the production of Turok and Turok 2, both of which were important to the Nintendo 64's success as the second most popular video game console of the late 90s, at least in North America. I think they may have been number three in Japan. That's still cool though. You get a medal, dude. Americans just love these first-person shooter thingies, and Nintendo knew that if their upcoming GameCube was going to have any chance at being the second most popular console in North America, then they had better get a North American studio on their side to make them some of those first-person shooters. Sadly, it didn't really work out that way. The GameCube was number three. Here's that medal we were talking about, dude. And Nintendo was probably dismayed when instead of getting Turok 3 for the GameCube, Jeff Spangenberg set out to make four separate games at the very same time that were completely different. Indeed, the vast majority of Turok's development team didn't even follow Jeff Spangenberg to Retro Studios. Turok's lead designer, David Dienspier, stayed with Acclaim. But from 1998 to the year 2000, Retro Studios valiantly worked on those four games. Raven's Blade, an ambitious action RPG that looked like a mid-90s fantasy game for the PC, a football game, a car combat game, and some kind of action-adventure game about women fighting aliens in outer space. What's up with that? And after two years of development, none of them were even close to being ready for the Nintendo GameCube. Bummer, dog. In the year 2000, Shigeru Miyamoto visited Retro Studios, had some barbecue, and was horrified not only to find that Turok 3 was not waiting on his desk, but that the studio had pissed away years of time and lots of money. Nintendo money. Outrage! Barbecue over! Miyamoto did not like Retro Studios games. <laughs> like what does he know, right? But he allegedly did like the game engine for the unnamed action adventure, which may have had something to do with its first person perspective. Or not, this is disputed, whether or not the game had a first person perspective or not that is. But if Miyamoto was indeed impressed with the completed game engine, then I'm certain it probably employed the first person perspective, because it was this game engine that would become the foundation for Metroid Prime. Between 2000 and Metroid Prime's release in the year 2002, all of Retro's other games would be cancelled, and the company's 200 or so employees were drastically cut back as entire development teams were laid off, but many of the best creators were retained and put to work on Metroid Prime. Metroid Prime was a major success for Nintendo, at least critically, since, you know, not, not everybody bought a GameCube garnering universal praise and declarations that the game was indeed the greatest of all time. They had acquired their first person masterpiece for the GameCube, after all. So in 2002, in order to thank him, Nintendo bought out Jeff Spangenberg, fired him from his own company, and transformed Retro Studios into a Nintendo subsidiary, where it has been ever since, making games exclusively for Nintendo. Metroid Prime is possibly the single best game on the GameCube, but its sequels, Metroid Prime 2 in 2004 and Metroid Prime 3 for the Wii in 2007, are also widely regarded as being among the best games of their generation. Not only were these games highly polished first-person shooters, but they successfully merged that genre with the deeply immersive and haunting open world of Metroid, 
emphasizing the sense of foreboding loneliness and exploration above the trigger-happy shooting gallery tendencies of other first-person shooters, though Metroid Prime has some of that too. Then in 2008, after a group of key developers left to start their own company called Armature Studio, Retro switched to making new entries in the Donkey Kong Country series, again, making games that satisfied pretty much everybody. Well, everybody except for Microsoft executives, who thought they owned the rights to Donkey Kong after they bought Rare in 2002. Sorry dudes, Rare may have put the monkey back on the map, but it's Nintendo that owns the characters. Not even Universal Studios can say anything about that, dog. But not everything Retro Studios sets out to create ends up as a finished video game. In 2020, it was discovered by the excellent Metroid fan site, ShineSparkers, that a former Retro Studios concept artist named Sammy Hall had shared some old artwork that he had done for Retro Studios on ArtStation, a popular place for professional artists to share their work. This is routine stuff. But the artwork that Sammy Hall had shared was from two cancelled Retro Studios projects that set the internet ablaze with wonder. One was intended to be a spin-off of the Zelda series, focusing in on the popular chic people established by the Ocarina of Time. The other was a Mario spin-off starring King Boo. But these projects were from sometime between 2005 and 2008, and both were cancelled very early in their development, never really leaving the concept stage of production. But then, sometimes it seems that Retro Studios has been forced to cancel games that get much farther along, perhaps even very far along into development. And how do we know this? From a mysterious and somewhat troubling gap in Retro Studios' history of game releases, looking at a timeline starting in 2002 with their first game, Metroid Prime, we find that up until 2014, Retro Studios had been releasing a new game every one to two years on average, for a period of about 12 years. After Metroid Prime, Metroid Prime 2 is released in 2004. It took three years to see Metroid Prime 3 for the Wii in 2007, but it was only two years more until they put out Metroid Prime Trilogy in 2009. This must have been in production at the same time as Donkey Kong Country Returns, because it was released the following year, 2010. And Mario Kart 7 was released in 2011, a game which they had helped on. These were Retro's most productive years, which ended sometime between 2011 and 2013. Afterwards, it would take two years for Donkey Kong Returns to show up on the 3DS. And here is our first noticeable bump in the road. But Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze for the Wii U would come out in 2014. However, the gap between this game and its predecessor in 2010 is noticeable. What happened between 2010 and 2014? These games are very similar, and you'd think development between them would be shorter. But even more troubling is the second gap. Retro Studios wouldn't put out another game for an additional four years. But the game they put out was Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze for the Switch, a port of the Wii U game that they released in 2014. That means, as of today, Retro Studios has not put out a brand new game in something like seven years. What happened? As you probably know, it was announced in 2019 that Nintendo had decided to scrap work on Metroid Prime 4, which was allegedly being developed by Namco Bandai and restart the project entirely at Retro Studios in Austin, Texas. So as of early 2019, we know for sure that Retro Studios has been diligently working on a new game. We've seen all the hiring of top-level talent that they've done. We've heard about their new office space, which I recently visited. More on that later. But what about the last six or seven years? Surely since 2014, maybe even since 2010, Retro Studios has been working on more games than just Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze for the Switch. Based on their first 12 years of production, it's safe to assume that they had, at the very least, worked on one major game that would have been released around 2016, and obviously that game would have been either for the Wii U or the 3DS. This is puzzling, but there are some clues. 
Many people on YouTube have commented on the fact that at various times, Retro Studios has had a difficult time with employee retention. Damn, dog! Why don't people want to work there? Obviously, there were all the people laid off between 2000 and 2002, but that doesn't count because we know Retro Studios was in major trouble and that they canceled all their other games to make Metroid Prime. But what about 2008, when a group of ex-Metroid Prime developers left to start Armature Studios, the makers of the beloved ReCore for the Xbox? Well, in one interview with Game Informer in 2016, Mark Passini, the lead developer of both Metroid Prime 2 and 3 and the co-founder of Armature Studios, commented on his departure say, saying essentially that he left simply because he wanted to challenge himself and to do things outside of the Retro Studios framework. So far, it looks like there's not much drama or mystery regarding these early departures. However, in 2012, Brian Walker, Retro Studios' Senior Director of Development since the year 2003, and therefore a key management figure for both the Metroid Prime and Donkey Kong Country games, abruptly left the company for unknown reasons. Brian Walker can be seen here giving GameSpot a tour of Retro Studios' original North Austin location on Kramer. I find it interesting and a little bit perplexing how these development teams find time to both collect and apparently even play with all of these toys. Maybe the real reason we haven't seen a game from Retro Studios in like seven years is that they spend all of their time messing around. It, it helps us be more efficient, helps us be focused, and helps us create um, the kind of content that we hope the, uh, the players will really like. Whatever you say, dude. Looking at Brian Walker's employment history on LinkedIn, we see that he left Retro in April of 2012 and that he was subsequently unemployed for eight months before taking a job at Intific in Austin, Texas for less than a full year before he started the Austin Burrito Company in May of 2014. Arriba! <laughs> yeah! This is how they made salsa. This is fascinating. The senior director of development of Retro Studios is also a connoisseur of fine Mexican cuisine. Well, maybe not that fine. Sadly, the Austin Burrito Company, for some reason, has been closed since 2017. Well ahead of the curve, since the rest of the restaurant industry wouldn't be decimated for at least another two years. He's like a pioneer, dog. But why did Brian Walker leave Retro Studios in the first place? He was, by the look of it, the number two guy at a well-respected and beloved video game studio. Surely, he didn't love Mexican food that much. Arriba! <laughs> and since he was unemployed for eight months after leaving, there is little reason to believe that his departure was planned. Yeah, like, what about health insurance, dude? I mean, it could have been, but it's still really weird, and he left at an odd time. Looking at the timeline, he probably left in the middle of production of Donkey Kong for the 3DS, and probably in the early phases of Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze. But what went wrong? Could there have been issues between Brian Walker and the Japanese management of Retro Studios from Nintendo? As the senior director of development, could Brian Walker be the significant difference that kept Retro Studios game development so regular from 2003 to 2011. Obviously, he can't be blamed for the huge gap in Retro's production from 2014 to the present. So perhaps Brian Walker's leadership was instrumental to the company's ability to get work done. And now that he's gone, it's just not happening. This is a hypothesis, but let's examine some evidence that may test it. On September 24, 2020, a YouTuber called AuraCrest reposted an old GameSpot feature about Retro Studios from the Wii days, when Metroid Prime 3 was still under development. So sometime between 2005 and 2007. This includes the aforementioned tour of Retro by Brian Walker. Just look at all these toys, dude! It, it helps us be more efficient, helps us be focused. Yeah, bro. You think Shigeru Miyamoto believes that? I don't know, dog. He looks kind of pissed to me. Anyway, during the tour, Brian Walker gives us an insight into what development is actually like in Austin, Texas. Again, they seem to play around a lot here. 
Brian shows off their dry erase board, which is routinely covered in cartoons and goofy slogans. Hey, check it out! They have the G.I. Joe aircraft carrier! Before the NES came out, this was the ultimate dream of every suburban boy in America. I say suburban because your parents had to have some pretty major square footage if they were going to buy you a $100 piece of plastic that came in a box that measured 42 inches wide. If the 1980s was the pinnacle of American excess, then a toy aircraft carrier that's as long as a surfboard is probably a fitting symbol. And it's incredible that Retro Studios was able to find both space and time to house one. Right, Mr. Miyamoto? Well, at least these guys like it. It, it helps us be more efficient, helps us be focused, and helps us create um, the kind of content that we hope the, uh, the players will really like. Sounds good to me, dude. Then Retro Studios president Michael Kelbaugh points out that Retro Studios is fundamentally a Nintendo company and that they develop games in cooperation with Nintendo. I don't really think of Retro as an individual entity, of our friends at Nintendo as an individual entity. I think of the Metroid Prime team. Some of that team happens to be in Japan, some of it happens to be in Redmond, Washington, and we all get together a lot to build great games. Brian Walker sings the praises of the Wii and points out the following. And we also had uh, excellent support not only from the uh, development uh, support teams at uh, NOA but also NCL uh, in Japan as well. Wow, it sounds like Retro Studios works really close with Nintendo of Japan. Like, maybe uncomfortably close. It's not a typical developer publisher situation because we, Retro is Nintendo. And we are constantly held to that same bar that EAD is held to, that all of the Japanese uh, developers that make Nintendo games are held to, constantly. Wow! It sounds like there's a lot of pressure from Japan to get things done the Nintendo way, which of course is great, right Mr. Miyamoto? They uh, really gave us a lot of assistance and uh, really helped focus a lot of support on us It proved instrumental. That's intense, dog. We don't consider ourselves a Western developer. We consider ourselves a Nintendo developer. We just happen to be in Texas. So it sounds to me like Retro Studios is very firmly watched and controlled by Nintendo of Japan. And that only makes sense, since Nintendo essentially owns the company and expects quality games to come from it. But at the same time, what must it be like to work for a company that has top management that is, in turn, accountable to Japanese management at Nintendo? It sounds like a recipe for a shitty work environment, if you ask me. Because while normal offices put workers under the leadership of a single manager, who cracks the metaphorical whip, as they say, and occasionally redirects your team, Retro Studios has at least two tiers. The Austin management team, and then the Japanese management team, above them. Well, who are you accountable to? And if Team America suggests one thing, but then Team Japan says do another, and these things are mutually exclusive, what are you supposed to do? If you choose one management team over the other, the one you cross will blame you, and you'll be disgraced and forced to commit seppuku. Or at the very least, you'll resign and go and work at EA or Blizzard, or make Mexican food. Arriba! Whichever's a worse fate, it's hard to say. All I'm saying is that this unique situation described by Brian Walker and Michael Kelball sounds to me like a recipe for disaster. But not only do we have a company with two tiers of management who oversee the development of games, but one of these teams is in sleepy laid back to the point of being perpetually hung over Austin, Texas. And the other is in Kyoto, Japan, a culture that prides itself on being the best at perfectly folding things and taking all of the fun out of drinking tea. Let me tell you, in Texas, this is not how people drink tea. I don't think these two worlds can very neatly be forced together. Because if you approach a Nintendo title with the Western style of development mentality, you will not succeed. Every little pixel counts. That is much different from the way Western developers develop games. Exactly! That's what I'm saying! Then in 2009, IGN published a mini-documentary going behind the scenes of Retro Studios, 
just as Metroid Prime Trilogy was being released for the Wii. Michael Kelball is still stoked about being in Texas. Retro is unique in the sense that we love being in Texas. I mean, Texas is just a cool place. And that really reflects in the culture. But he also reminds us that we are Nintendo employees. We have a very different perspective on developing games. We really strive to think like our friends in Japan. You'd better, dog. We appreciate the opportunity of the, of the mentorship that we're given from people like Mr. Sakamoto, Mr. Tanabe, Mr. Miyamoto. Um, no other North American developer is going to get that experience working with that caliber of, of individual or individuals on a project by project basis. It's just not gonna happen in North America. But the question I'm having is, should it? I have nothing against Nintendo of Japan, but most people don't even like their American boss looking over their shoulder. How would you like a team of Japanese suits looking over your other shoulder? These characters are not cute enough. Make them cuter. Anything you want, sir. I'll make it kawaii. Let's hear what Brian Walker has to say about his experience working at Retro Studios. I joined Retro in June of 2003, and I'm uh, the Senior Director of Development. Uh, when I first got here, I found the studio was definitely in a state of transition. Uh, they had just rolled off shipping uh, Metroid Prime 1, trying to find some traction on Metroid Prime 2, and really coping with uh, uh, some pretty significant cultural challenges uh, in the process. Oh, you don't say. My job is to try to mediate between uh, our friends at NCL and retro staff. I need to try to train retro staff, or at the time, needed to train retro staff to think like a Nintendo developer. So, like I said, working for Retro likely means not just doing your job and completing the project given to you, but you also have to navigate two separate management teams who speak two separate languages and have very different cultural outlooks, expectations, and even values. While there's no doubt that this sounds like an interesting work environment, it also sounds fundamentally dysfunctional. Here's Mike Wicken, senior developer of the Metroid Prime Trilogy. I can remember when we were developing Metroid Prime 1 very early on. We were discussing with Mr. Miyamoto um, how we could explore Samus's control scheme or do something unique. Mr. Miyamoto said, well, what if Samus could take off her head and maybe put a head on that had bug eyes? or a head that had, you know, saw in the dark or, or whatever, just switch heads. And we came out of the meeting and we went back into our office and we're like, bug eyes. And we drew pictures on the wall of Samus's helmet and then Samus with a bug head and just stared at it trying to understand, surely he can't mean that he wants Samus to switch heads and put on a bug head. See what I'm saying? What do you even do in a situation like that? You're trying to make Metroid Dinosaur Hunter 3. And then the crazy guy behind Donkey Kong Mario in The Legend of Zelda wants you to include swapping heads in your video game. And you want to call the cops, or at least run away. But instead you have to listen to him and pretend that this is sane advice. Personally, I would have just listened. This guy's a genius. What else can you tell us, Mr. Wiccan? We're pretty laid back as, as far as uh, the studio life is concerned. We've got a gym and uh, we've got a nice cafeteria. We've got a lot of assets that we can uh, use for making our day-to-day -day life better. Oh, we've seen your toy collections. We know exactly how laid back you are. Isn't that right, Mr. Miyamoto? <laughs> Going back to Retro Studios president, Mike Kelbaugh. How often would you say you meet with Nintendo of Japan on, say, a video call? The conference room that we were in to talk to NCL and Tanabe-san today was really, that's a really interesting room. Um, we do everything in that room, uh, everything from a design standpoint. Every game we've worked on has been, has been mapped out on the whiteboard in that room, uh, has been discussed. Well, I, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent in that room. We'll have video conferences with Tanabe-san until who knows how long. And it seems like he's sitting right there sometimes because we have him on for so long. But, you know, in turn, they're here a lot too. That room is the nucleus of retro. Wow. So it appears to me that Nintendo of Japan has a very hands-on approach when it comes to retro studios in Austin. And again, I don't blame them. But I also think this could explain why someone like Brian Walker would have left the company. 
or why game development would be so slow. I also think having a workplace that's a virtual playroom filled with distractions is also a possible cause for delay, and so is living in Austin, Texas. I'm a Texas native, and as of writing this video, we've been living in Austin for years. And let me tell you, this isn't exactly a city for industrious go-getters. Austin's great for waking up late, grabbing a beer, and drifting down the river. But maybe not so great if you want to make a lot of hit video games in a short period of time. There are too many distractions. There are too many amazing things outdoors that you'd rather do. Who wants to be stuck inside coding for Nintendo when you can get world-class barbecue, attend an outdoor rock concert, and ride around on an electric scooter to six different bars, all in the same afternoon. But let's examine some more evidence. In recent years, there have been multiple claims about what Retro Studios has secretly been working on over the last few years. Some have pointed to another entry in the Donkey Kong series, which is plausible. On June 16th of 2020, YouTuber Blueshell pointed out that amongst Retro's new hires are developers of the 3D platformer Super Lucky's Tale, including Stefan Dupree, who actually was the lead designer of Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze. I'm guessing a fully 3D Donkey Kong title may have been in the works for the Wii U, but was perhaps to move over to the Switch due to low Wii U sales. Maybe some of these 3D platform guys are there to either restart or finish a project like that. No one can really say for sure. But of course, as you probably already know, the real big rumor was that Retro Studios had been working on a Star Fox game called Star Fox Grand Prix that would have combined Star Fox and Mario Kart-like game mechanics into a whimsical racing game. But now, according to Tyler McVicker, this rumor was created by Nintendo as fake news meant to help them trace and weed out any leakers within the company. At the same time, nothing about this story has ever been confirmed, as far as I'm aware, and so I remain both open and skeptical regarding any claims about the existence or non-existence of Star Fox Grand Prix. But there is a third, less talked about possible game. In November 2019, a member of the video game forum Reset Era, named Walker Texas Ranger, claimed to have talked with people who had inside knowledge of the workings of Retro Studios, and they told him that Retro Studios had indeed been working for three years on an RPG with a strange singing game mechanic, but that it was abruptly cancelled so that the studio could make Metroid Prime 4. The game apparently struggled to go anywhere, even though it was in development for so long, but it would have allowed players to quote, manipulate their environments by singing. Weird. Or is it? Now this is not very credible evidence. An anonymous user on Reset Era who talked to a guy who knows a guy at Retro Studios. Come on, man! This is CCP. We've got standards here. We don't waste your time with nonsense. Except there's some more evidence we've found that kind of makes this story a bit more plausible. Ever since the news about Metroid Prime 4 being restarted at Retro Studios broke back in January of 2019, a lot of people have been using websites like Glassdoor.com and LinkedIn in order to learn more about who's leaving and coming to the company in recent months. Normally, I wouldn't put much faith in sources like this, especially Glassdoor, which is mainly a place people go to vent complaints or get passive revenge on former employers. Glassdoor is supposed to be a place that current or former employees can review what the work experience is actually like at a company and therefore warn or entice potential job applicants. Unfortunately, just about anybody can anonymously claim to have worked at any given company, regardless of whether or not it's actually true. So, it's not exactly a great venue for unbiased information, but a couple of newer entries on that site for Retro Studios have greatly piqued my interest. First of all, check out the 3.2 out of 5 overall review score for Retro Studios, and compare that to Armature Studios 4.3, or even Blizzard's 3.5. Dang dude, Retro's got a lower score than Blizzard? What's going on over there? The newest entry, as of making this video, is from February of 2021, and it's allegedly from a former employee who was at the company for about a year. Predictably, this reviewer complains about the pay and healthcare benefits. Get in line, buddy! But then they go into specific management issues, saying that the reason games take so long to be made at Retro is that management is inept, 
and that the devs are old and inexperienced with new technology and that the company relies on a clunky old game engine that needs to be replaced. Further, the devs are talentless and wouldn't survive elsewhere. Wow, what a thing to say. He doesn't like the management and says that miscommunication is a frequent problem. They also mention problems with being managed by Nintendo in Japan, suggesting that the Japanese micromanage all projects, such that every decision must pass their scrutiny, greatly slowing down the speed of production. That sounds about right from what we've seen so far. He says Japan frequently requires work to be redone or thrown out entirely, which is consistent with Nintendo management as we know it. I mean, after all, these were the same people willing to completely start Metroid Prime over from the very beginning, even though it's been in development for years. The second review is even more interesting, and it's from one month prior, January of 2021. This reviewer claims to have worked at Retro for five years, and he has chosen to title his review, A Limp Handshake and a Fake Smile. I need your vote, partner. Well, you got it, Governor Bush. What's wrong, Hank? Oh my God, his handshake. It's limp. This review makes the claim that the best game development decisions and contributions actually come from Nintendo's Japanese team, which oversees projects done at Retro, which is again consistent with what we've heard and seen, as troubling as it is. They say Austin is fun, but they complain about the social pressure to eat provided meals that reek of plantation slavery. What? Does this person mean barbecue? If there was ever proof that this is an authentic review, then it's this line, because I don't think a faker would be this aware of how important barbecue is to Austin, or this resentful of that fact. Personally, I'd never complain about having to eat Texas barbecue, and I'd never reduce it to the food of plantation slavery. As far as I'm concerned, it's the food of my people. He goes on, Sometimes there are crunches for projects that are cancelled, and devs can be laid off if a certain part of a game doesn't appeal to people, even though those devs did exactly what they were directed to do. Management doesn't take responsibility for people disliking something, even if they were the ones directing its creation. Man, that sure sounds like this guy could have been working on a game with singing as a game mechanic to me. Can't you imagine someone at Retro suggesting they add singing as a game mechanic? After all, both the Wii U and the 3DS had microphones. Perhaps someone wanted to take advantage of this, but the execution was poor, and this poor dude got blamed for it sucking. Can I remind you that Shigeru Miyamoto wanted you to swap heads in Metroid Prime? He goes on, A decade ago, Retro's golden age of middle management with a spine came to an abrupt end. Wow! A decade ago would imply the reviewer is referring to the abrupt departure of Brian Walker in 2012. And it sounds like Brian Walker, as per my hypothesis, was instrumental to the studio's ability to turn out a product. Perhaps. Let's keep going. Halfway through Donkey Kong Returns, middle management was chosen almost at random in a mad scramble. I can only imagine this was the beginning of insecurities, passive aggressiveness, jealousy, and avoidance of personal responsibilities. So again, this sounds like he's referring to the departure of Brian Walker in 2012, which occurred about a year before the release of Donkey Kong Returns for the 3DS. However, what's inconsistent here is the fact that this former employee claims to have worked for Retro for five years. Working backwards, that means they started with the company around 2015 or 2016. How could they have known about Brian Walker except for maybe hearsay from other employees? Or perhaps they're writing this review a few years after their departure, which seems unlikely. Anyway, he concludes with some words of advice to Nintendo and Retro Studios. The challenge of a second party development team is that they feel the need to create some illusion of middle management. As a result, my peers have had to seek therapy because they have a handful of different bosses. This is very strange. 
changing things back and forth constantly. When everyone knows that in two weeks Nintendo will come down and dictate the true direction. Question if creating fake management positions is really healthy for the devs that are truly creating the game world. So as we've said, Retro is suffering from a case of too much management. You start to go one way, but then Japan says go another. Please one manager and you'll upset the other. It sounds like navigating this issue was a bit easier under the leadership of Brian Walker. I joined Retro in June of 2003 and I'm uh, the Senior Director of Development. Uh, when I first got here, I found the studio was definitely in a state of transition. Uh, they had just rolled off shipping uh, Metroid Prime 1, trying to find some traction on Metroid Prime 2, and really coping with uh, uh, some pretty significant cultural challenges uh, in the process. But after he left in 2012, things kind of spiraled out of control between the U.S. development team and the micromanagement by Nintendo of Japan. In 2012, Ryan Harris was promoted by Retro Studios as the new director of production, likely replacing the role performed by Brian Walker. In 2019, he moved on to be the director of planning at Retro Studios, which is a position he still retains today. Could Ryan Harris be the limp wrist fake smile foretold by the legend? If anyone out there knows anything about this, could you please DM me via our Twitter account? Just look up Creative Cat Productions on Twitter, you can't miss us. So anyway, why hasn't Retro Studios put out a new game in roughly 7 years? And what were they working on up until Metroid Prime 4 was restarted in January of 2019? There's really no way for me to know for sure, and believe me I've tried. We even went to visit Retro Studios' new office off of Lamar in Austin, Texas. It's been misreported in the recent past that Retro was getting a massive new building all to themselves. But as you can see from this sign, Retro is just one of a handful of businesses at this office park. We went inside, looking for clues, and we found this Dropbox with their company logo, and this directory indicating that the entire third floor of the building is being rented out by Retro. Probably the main reason for this move is security against snoops like us, since you can't even operate the elevator without a special keycard, and therefore, there was really nothing to see. Contrast this with Retro Studios' former location on Kramer, which is just a few minutes away, and oddly enough, a block away from our jiu-jitsu gym at Black Widow MMA. Anyway, scoping out the Kramer location, we found that it was excessively easy to snoop through the windows and mini blinds. There's the reception area, and there's that whiteboard people used to doodle on when they were supposed to be working. I'm thinking the situation with the company's toys and movie theater might be another reason for the move to Lamar. Perhaps they needed more room to develop Metroid Prime 4, but also maybe Nintendo stipulated that Retro Studios' new office be outfitted more toward actual work and away from recreation. Good luck winning that battle in Austin, Texas, dudes! Austin is a place where 30-year-olds go to retire. My guys, if you want to finish a game like Metroid Prime 4, I think you really need to move to a city that likes to get up in the morning. A city with a work ethic, with a little more oomph. Shigeru Miyamoto-san, this is where you need to move Retro Studios to beautiful Houston, Texas. Domo arigato, Mr. Roboto. Domo. 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 Houston has a better cost of living, less to do outside, and even worse weather than Austin, Texas. This means that it's an optimal city to get computer programmers and artists inside and sober, making video games in a nice air-conditioned office. That's just a suggestion. Another suggestion might be to lay off of Retro Studios and let them do their best to come up with a good game on their own terms, without constantly changing the direction of their projects. Perhaps Retro would have put out some more games by now if Nintendo of Japan would just lay off of them in the first place. Perhaps Brian Walker wouldn't have abruptly left the company in 2012. Maybe that dude who thinks barbecue reeks of plantation slavery would still be there, complaining about delicious free food. But Nintendo, who am I to tell you what to do? I've never made a video game, and I've sure as hell never made no Mario Brothers before, but I do know this. 
Retro Studios was working on something around the year 2016 or so, and whatever it was, was cancelled due to including elements of gameplay that management didn't like. And these elements could very well have included singing into a microphone as a possible game mechanic. Has Retro failed to produce a new game in 7 years because the devs at Retro failed to make a commercially viable game? Or maybe they had to cancel projects due to the failure of the Wii U? Or perhaps forcing employees to answer to two separate management structures simultaneously is untenable? You decide! And please, let us know what you think in the comments! Hopefully, Metroid Prime 4 will be done soon, and it will be awesome, but given the history of Retro Studios and their current situation, I think the wait could be at least another two years. Thanks for watching. Oh, and before we go, we just want to say thank you to Genovi, who put out a video about small YouTubers that he recommends. On August 20th, we were one of the featured channels, and it really made our day. Our subs went through the roof almost pushing us to the 1000 mark. Sadly, YouTube reversed much of those gains, but we've been seeing steady growth ever since. Thank you Genovi for your kind words and for promoting our channel. We hope to keep striving to make the best content that we can. If y'all have the chance, please check out Genovi's video. And also, might I recommend his excellent coverage of the 32X and Sega history. I'll leave a link in the description. But now it's time for me to say, as I tend to at the end of these, Bye-bye now.